Amen, and blessed be. Spring has officially sprung. It was a little bit of an overcast weekend, but it is here. Something about this time of year makes me incredibly happy. Even in Orange County, where the weather is pretty amazing all year long, spring is extra special. The long, sunny days and the increased wildlife activity. I think yesterday I noticed quails foraging in the bushes outside of my home. It was the first time I had seen them. And of course the flowers are blooming. It makes sense. The earth is just bursting with life this time of year. It's fresh and new. I've seen a lot of Facebook posts and conversations lately about how Christians chose to coordinate Easter with pagan rituals that happened in the springtime. We also know that Easter's somewhat connected to the Jewish holiday of Passover. To me, it just makes sense. Without any historical detail, if you're going to pick a time of year to celebrate new life, rebirth, the renewal, spring just makes sense. Every spring, we get the reminder of the natural cycle of renewal and the beauty of new life. The burden, though, isn't all on the earth for this celebration. Because if we don't have a little patience to pay attention, if we don't recognize the beauty of this moment, it will pass us by. If you've been around tapestry for a while, you know that I'm particularly fond of frog and toad. They're fun and silly, and they always point to a little life lesson. This story in particular resonated with me. Remember, Frog's dad had told him that spring was just around the corner, so he went on a long journey looking around various corners. Finally, when he returned home, he found spring was waiting for him there. It's silly and a great depiction of our own lives. We spend so much time and energy on a journey seeking that big event, that big achievement, or maybe avoiding that big fear. We search with such determination, ignoring the fact that the big prizes that we seek may be completely outside of our control. It's going to happen or not, whether or not we go seeking for it. Like the turning of the seasons, a lot of what life has in store is completely out of our hands. Meanwhile, along the journey toward that big prize, we come upon all sorts of other things worth our attention. Remember, Frog didn't find nothing around those corners. He found a pine tree and a worm taking a nap and a lizard chasing its tail. We too stumble upon unexpected new joys in the journey, but if we don't pause to appreciate them in our pursuit of the big prize, we can miss so much. There's a Buddhist practice of cultivating an appreciation for those pine trees and napping worms and lizards chasing their tails. It's called Beginner's Mind. You may have heard of this. Beginner's Mind comes to us from Zen Buddhism, and as it sounds, Beginner's Mind is an attempt to bring a sense of newness to every encounter. It's a commitment to openness and eagerness in learning. There are a lot of different ways it can be used. In Zen practice, it's mostly connected to study and learning. In a lot of fields, as you advance in your learning, it becomes more and more tempting to feel confident and to dismiss a lot of really good ideas. But a sense of openness can avoid some of that. Today, as we're talking about the newness of spring and appreciating the journey, one of the best applications of beginner's mind is try to experience the mundane in some new ways. 
I tend to live a pretty routinized life. I think a lot of us do. We drive the same routes getting where we need to go. We eat a lot of the same foods. We can tune out a lot of those experiences very quickly. Beginner's mind invites us to slow way down. Sitting down to a meal, for example, to notice the texture of the napkin and the shape of the spoon. Is it shiny? Notice the weight of the spoon, the coldness of the metal. And before diving into that food, does it have a smell? What does it look like? What are the colors? Now it's time to taste it. Notice everything you can. Is it hot? Can you taste the ingredients that you put into it? And if you didn't taste, if you didn't cook it, can you identify everything involved? What's the texture? Does the taste change as you chew it? And which bite finally makes you satisfied? There are so many details to a single meal that we don't even notice. Each one of those is an opportunity for pleasure, really, and enjoyment. The same slow attention could be applied to walking your dog or a whole variety of different things. Now, not many of us have the dedication to live every day with that kind of awareness. But a meal here and there or a walk with fresh eyes could bring an absolutely new source of joy to our lives. There's one last use of beginner's mind that I wanted to mention. It's bringing openness and fresh ears to navigating our relationships, both in challenging relationships and in loving ones. In challenging ones, we very quickly create expectations of how someone is going to behave. And we burden those people with negative expectations. <coughs> Things might go much better if we see each interaction as a freestanding event to bring a new conversation about. Or, the opposite is also true. After being close with someone for a long time, we can begin to expect the good things. And when we expect the good things, sometimes we take them for granted. What if we were surprised every time our spouse was thoughtful? Or every time a friend comforted us? Bringing a beginner's mind allows us to appreciate people as well as the moments of our lives. Now, paying attention and staying alert is also a commitment to paying attention to our neighbors. In this chaotic year of politics and greed and injustice, part of my mind wants to take a break, to close my eyes, to plug up my ears, to crawl back in bed for five more minutes of sleep, hoping that things will be better when I wake up. I can't count the number of issues that I have ignored with this hope. I know that most recently, I willfully ignored the death of Stephen Clark. He's an African-American man who was shot by police in Sacramento on March 16th. A whole city here in our state is roiling with racial tension. I kind of knew that, that yes, another black man had been killed by police. For some reason, though, I couldn't read more than the headlines of those articles. Instead of doing the hard work of waking up and paying attention, I pressed the snooze button. Five more minutes of sleep, that's all I need. And maybe this whole thing will be better when I wake up. But that's not how sleeping works. The coffee doesn't make itself. We have to face the bright light of day, whether we're ready to or not. We have to make 
the sometimes uncomfortable first step out of our slumber to pay attention to the world around us. Whether it's the glorious smell of coffee or the bracing news of another injustice, this is the season of a world waking up. In just a moment, we'll participate in our flower communion. It's one of the few rituals that Unitarian Universalists have in nearly every congregation. It doesn't look exactly the same, but at some point in the spring across the country, people use flowers for a ritual. The flower communion originated in 1923 with Dr. Norbert Chopek. He was the founder of the Unitarian movement in Czechoslovakia. He sought a ritual that would make sense to his diverse religious community. Most of them were former Catholics, and the symbols of bread and wine didn't really fit anymore. So he looked around for symbols that could relate to everyone, symbols of newness and hope. So he instructed his congregation to gather flowers from the mountains surrounding the town. In 1940, Nazi forces took control of Prague. They found Dr. Chopek's gospel of inherent worth and dignity of every person to be too subversive, too dangerous. So they sent him to Dachau. This gentle man suffered a cruel death, but his message of hope and dignity lives on through the flower communion in our congregations today. As we remember to look at our world with new eyes every day, with a beginner's mind, I was reminded this year of the religious liberty that we so often take for granted. It's part of our routine to gather as a community on Sunday mornings. Sure, we do it every week. It's pretty mundane. But it's a special right that still today in many parts of the world denied. So let us take this sacred let us not take this sacred moment for granted. Our freedom to worship is a gift to appreciate and to defend for generations to come. With the return of the sun and the invitation of the flowers, with the newness of spring, let us wake up to a world around us. Beauty abounds and our neighbors are calling for help. So let's skip the snooze bar and awaken to this glorious, complicated life that is ours. Amen.